I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. His name is Linnaeus. Electrophorus electricus, Linnaeus. Here at the lab, we just call him Joe. He isn't exactly what you'd call a raving beauty, is he? But he has his points. For one thing, he's quite a swimmer. Notice the wave motion of the long ventral fin. As the waves travel toward the rear, the eel is propelled forward. Reverse, the waves travel toward the head. How about ascending and descending? Well, to ascend, he merely starts waves at the center, which go both ways. And to descend, the waves start at both ends and work toward the middle. Joe is commonly called an electric eel. But actually, it isn't an eel at all, but a fish of the carp or catfish family. Now, the eel part of his name may not be correct, but he sure came by the electric part honestly. There are stories of cattle, horses, even human beings being killed by the electric shock of eels just like this. In fact, along the Amazon River, ranchers have lost so many cattle that they have what they call electric eel drives. They herd the eels into shallow water and then uh, they kill them with their machetes. Oh yes, they have insulated handles on the machetes. Now, of course, electrical impulses can't be seen. But if we put an electrode at each end of the tank, we can hear the electrical discharge on a loudspeaker. Now, those gentle pulses are part of the eel's radar system. In some mysterious way, he uses them to locate his food. Now, so far as we know, all adult electric eels are blind. They have heavy cataracts on their eyes. Now, eels feed on small fish. And if it weren't for this radar system, they'd starve to death. Now, when an eel locates a fish or uh, when he is disturbed, he puts out what we call the double whammy. This is a terrific shock that stuns anything in the water nearby. The only way you can describe Joe's table manners is to say that they're downright shocking. unlike most fish, is an air breather. It must rise to the surface from time to time for air. For this reason, he can be quite comfortable out of water. Now, the vital organs of the electric eel are all in the front 10 inches of his body. The rest is pure power plant. And believe it or not, he can generate more than 500 volts. Here we have a bank of 36 neon lamps. We'll connect these to uh, our eel electrode. Now, of course, the eel is designed to operate in water. His electrical system doesn't function too well in air, but even under these conditions, he should give us enough power to light the lights. For some reason, people seem to find it difficult to believe that a fish could put out any considerable amount of power. Even some of the folks here at the laboratory been just a little bit skeptical about Joe's electrical prowess. And for that reason, we've asked a few of them if they wouldn't help us in an experiment. Will you have the group come in now, please? All right. Okay. You stand right over here, please. The rest of you just line up there. Be right over here, Mr. Humphrey. That's fine. Now, Dave, if you'll take this, please, and hold it in your right hand. Louis, you hold this one. That's fine. Now, everybody join hands. That's right. Now you're connected in series. 
Now, there are five of you. That means that each of you will receive just one-fifth of the total voltage of the eel. Now, relax. We'll give you the low-voltage tap first. Ready? <laughs> Did you feel that? That was bad, was it? <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you meet a group of confirmed believers in electric eels. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, where did that electricity come from? Strange as it may seem, the eel's electric tissue is made up of cells very much like the cells that make up the nerves of our own bodies. These cells are called electroplaques. Here is a crude model of one of these cells. Actually, the electroplaque is a tiny battery, one twenty-fifth of an inch thick. Now, in a flashlight, there are three cells. Each cell generates one and a half volts. Three of them in series produce the four and a half volts necessary for the lamp. The eel's battery produces one-tenth of a volt. Ten of them in series will produce one volt. Well, at this rate, it would take 5,000 of these to produce the 500 volts of the eel. Well, he's got them and then some. An eel like Joe here probably has 250,000 electric cells. Connect them in series, 5,000 of them, and you have the 500 volts. The rest of them are connected in parallel to build up the current capacity. Now, each one of these tiny batteries has an electronic switch controlled by a signal sent along the nerve fiber connected to it. When an eel wants to shock something, it throws hundreds of thousands of switches all at once just by thinking about it. But what to me is even more amazing is that when Joe's battery is run down, he can recharge them, all of them, in just a thousandth of a second. That's quite a power plant, isn't it? The eel's electrical system is composed of three main parts. The first is called the large electric organ. This is the source of the eel's main voltage. Now, the function of this organ, called the organ of Hunter, is still somewhat of a mystery, although scientists believe that in some way it works with the large organ in producing the double whammy. This organ, called the bundle of socks, is to me the most wonderful. It has been definitely identified as the source of those mysterious radar pulses. In other words, this is the power plant for the eel's radar transmitter. Now, of course, a radar system must have a receiver also. You notice those pits located in rows along the front part of the eel? The other night, I was in New York City talking with Dr. Christopher Coates, the director of the New York Zoological Society. Dr. Coates is the world's foremost authority on electric eels. He performed an experiment recently that seems to indicate that those pits are a definite part of the eel's radar receiving system. Now, if Joe is willing to cooperate, we can perform a similar experiment here. The problem is to render Joe's radar system temporarily inoperative. Now, if we paint these pits with an insulating liquid, and if these pits have anything to do with the radar apparatus, Joe will find it very difficult to locate a fish. Well, we won't go hungry. This is a liquid that will wash off very rapidly. All right, Bill, let's go back into your tent. That's right. Come on out now, like a good fella. Now, we want to give him a good supply of fish. All right, Joe is surrounded by his favorite delicacy, 
baby trout. But for the next few moments, at least, those fish are just as safe as if there weren't an electric eel within a thousand miles. You see, uh, Joe's radar is on the blink. Oh, his uh, transmitter's working all right. He's still putting out those radar pulses. Actually, it's his receiver that's not operating. Now, let's think for just a moment about what that means. To a certain extent, we can locate objects with our ears. We can tell roughly the direction from which a sound is coming. But you know, if I were blindfolded, I'd sure hate to try to catch a greased pig simply by listening to its squeal. But uh, this problem, compared to Joe's, is relatively simple. You see, sound travels 1,100 feet per second in air. But Joe's radar pulses travel at the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. This means that an electric eel's radar system must be able to interpret time difference that is less than one billionth of a second. This is so amazing as to be almost beyond belief. Yes, Joe, you're quite a fellow. You may not win any beauty contest, but you've given us a lot to think about. You've given us a new understanding God who made us all. Thank you.